Hello, everybody. We are going to go ahead and start in on our U.S. history standards today. And so we're going to be starting with standard 1.1. So this lecture is going to be all about innovations and from the time period of 1880 to 1920. So the standard that we are going to be following today is Utah's uh, is United States uh, 2 standard 1.1, which is students will assess how innovations in transportation, science, agriculture, manufacturing, technology, communication, and marketing transformed America in the 19th and early 20th century. So this is going to be one of two lectures that are going to deal with this standard. And so you will see a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today is basically these innovations and a briefly how they change the way uh, we live here in America and you know, a lot of places in the world too who also experience these same innovations as well. So we're going to start with the essential question that we will be answering for today's lecture. So think of the essential question as kind of like an exit ticket. This is my way of gauging how well did you understand the information that I'm presenting to you today. So you will be expected to respond to this question. And so I want you to identify and explain how innovations of the late 18th or 19th century and early 20th century impact in America in three of the following areas. Now, the three areas you can choose from are any which you choose. Um, but give me an example uh, of an innovation from one of those areas. Uh, give me reasonings for why that, uh, how that changes uh, America, um, how it changes behavior or something, and then respond in your written responses there. Now, I'll be grading these on a scale of, of one to four, just like any normal PBL. This is not going to count as a, well, let me take this. It will count as a, an assessment in a way. Um, and what I mean by that, it will not be the final assessment for the standard. However, it uh, will be something I will consider um, when you do calculate your final assessment. If you don't score great on the exam quiz for this assessment, um, I can consider your responses for this if they were really well constructed and you clearly show that you understood the standard or even exceed your understanding of the standard, I can go ahead and bump that score up since I have that uh, um, right to do this year. So just make sure you take the time and do a good quality answer. And I have put together a little kind of rubric on what my expectations are in your responses for that. And that will be connected into this assignment um, and so it will be highlighted if you want to take a look at that what are the standards i'm looking for as far as what your answer should include so let's start with a little context here um, the united states uh, had been industrializing since the late 18th century um, it is not the first industrial country in the world but it certainly uh, didn't fall that far after uh, the united kingdom who was the first and so after the american civil war the United States really solidifies that industrialization is the way of the future. Since the North was much more industrialized and they were able and capable to um, win the war because of the advantage of being solely industrialized, having more railroads and being able to provide more materials to soldiers and so forth, it really does solidify the United States is going to industrialize more so after the Civil War itself. And not only that, but they began to move westward, um, you know, west of the Mississippi uh, and more so. And that's something we'll talk about more in the next lecture. Um, but because of that, they are going to be getting access to new resources that allow them uh, to industrialize more. And so the industrialization, the rapid industrialization that takes place after the Civil War into the like, 1920s is commonly known as the Second Industrial Revolution. So something, a big difference between the first and second industrial revolution is something you do want to note because there are two distinct revolutions here. The first revolution was powered primarily by coal, um, burning of coal uh, to produce steam and move the mechanisms. Uh, that was the, the energy source that drove the, uh, um, the second in, or the first industrial revolution. Um, the use of iron as a means uh, for building mechanisms and, and buildings and so forth is more common. And then the, the big industry that really kind of uh, makes America um, the true industrialized power was textiles. And of course, you, if we recall from the Unit Zero and your eighth grade review videos, um, you know, the cotton that was made in the South or uh, farmed in the South by the slaves um, was sent north to be manufactured into clothing. Those are the textiles. And so that's something that continues to happen. But once the Civil War is over, um, the textile industry takes a major hit 
Um, and so there are other industries that will pop up in replace of them. The second industrial revolution is going to be fueled primarily through, well, not primarily, but it's going to be started to replace coal with petroleum, gas, right? And so gas powered engines, um, internal combustion engines are, are going to be the new thing that powers the second industrial revolution. On top of that, the use of electricity is going to come about and, and it's going to help power the second industrial revolution. And one of the major products that are going to be made, and it's not the only one, but one of the major ones that really gives America its industrial might is ability to manufacture steel. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit more, how that's possible uh, later in the lecture. So we're going to start with uh, and break it down the standard by different areas. And so we're going to start with transportation. And the first major transportation innovation that doesn't come during this period, but certainly takes off during this period and has expanded substantially during this period is the railroads. And so the railroads were invented in the United Kingdom and they come to the United States. And the first railroad line that was completed in the United States was the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad in 1828. And from then on, we see the building of more railroad, railroad lines throughout the United States including the first transcontinental railroad, which was completed in 1869 at Promontory Point in Utah. I imagine a lot of you remember learning about this in Utah studies in seventh grade. Now the railroads provided a much, uh, much more, much more capability in terms of movement of goods, of people. Um, you could carry more, it was faster. And, and you didn't, um, you could build it um, away from water. Um, something the railroad does is it replaces the canal systems um, that were used and the canals and rivers were used primarily to move large amounts of goods. Um, and so now you don't need those waterways. You can build the railroads uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, they build them through the mountains, you know, they, they tunnel mountains and they, uh, to build a transcontinental railroad. So this is something that um, it allows more movement uh, of goods and people across the great vastness of our country. Now, the requirement uh, to build these, there's a massive amount of capital needed. You got to pay workers, you got to buy materials, you got to go uh, out and build this stuff. And so it's very, very expensive. Now, the United States government had a vested interest in, in building more railroads. However, um, they used private industries to do it. And the way that they made that work was that the government would give land grants to these companies that built the railroads, like the Pacific Union. And they would give them these land grants where the line was going to be built. And then they would give them X amount of land that touched that land. So say 10 miles both ways from the west to the east of where that railroad line is going to be or north south depending on where it is would then belong to the railroad companies and those companies could use that land to sell and you know make capital from that and so this is how the railroads were built in this country um, through private industries uh, but with the backings of the united states government and so by doing so they've created more jobs so for more wage earners um, is something that was important as more people immigrated to the country, um, as well as um, you know, freed slaves needed jobs as well. Um, so this is something that does happen um, in the building of the railroads. Um, it promoted the growth of cities. It promoted Western expansion. You know, the United States, uh, going back to the idea of manifest destiny, they were determined to claim the lands from sea to sea. How do you claim the lands and make sure that land claim is strong? You have to uh, populate it. You have to have people who live there. And we're going to talk more about that. Other things the government did to try to promote Western growth in our next uh, lecture as well. It helped fuel industrialization more as they gained more access to raw materials in the West that were back, brought back to the East uh, and a little bit to the South uh, to um, you know, manufacture into products and goods. Other innovations, uh, such as the steamship, which eventually replaced the sailships, um, you know, wind power ships. Uh, the steamship uh, 
represented a significant upgrade to what, what the sail um, boats were uh, before. Um, they were faster, uh, they were more reliable, they were, uh, you could pretty much go in any season. Um, and so you had the original sail uh, ships, sorry, sorry, steamships, um, where they had, you know, they're powered by coal and such, and they, you know, have a steam engine on board. And they had these giant wheels, as you can kind of see in this picture that I'm circling here with my my mouse, um, and they would just kind of rotate. And then there's just a paddle boat that just, you know, went. And so that was pretty uh, innovative at that time. Eventually they get replaced with the screws that you see more on commercial ships today, uh, where it's underwater and it turns and so forth. Um, one of the uh, biggest uh, and most famous of these uh, steamships uh, was of course the, Tit uh, the HMS Titanic. Um, which, I mean, most people know the story of the Titanic, you know, one of the largest ships ever built, even though when you compare it to the ships today, it's not very close. Uh, but at that time, it was a, it was a you know, mar engineering marvel. Uh, and of course, in its maiden voyage, it crashes into an iceberg and sinks, and the most of the people of that uh, ship dies. And then you have, uh, you know, 80 years later, uh, a movie that's made about it that's very famous and makes the Titanic even more famous, right? So this, uh, the steamships themselves are important because they have become a major contributor in globalizing the international trade. Um, we are able to trade over broad and overseas much easier. We trade with all places, both importing and exporting goods. Um, the United States industrial might relied on getting raw materials from other countries sometimes, and as well as having markets to sell their manufactured goods too. And so the steamship plays a major role in their ability to do so. Another invention was the automobile. And of course the automobile, it was invented in 1885. I mean, what we think of the automobile today as far as a gas powered uh, carriage um, was invented by Carl Benz in Germany. Um, and until when he invented that until 1908, uh, the automobile was generally viewed as um, kind of a toy for the rich, a plaything for the rich, right? It would be kind of the equivalent of like owning a private helicopter today. Um, and if you do own a private helicopter, I know it's Skyline, not likely, but still, um, it's very rare to, to have them, right? Um, unlike where today the automobile is pretty much owned by most people in, um, and working families in the country. Um, the reason why that's possible, in 1908, um, the first uh, the Model T rolls off uh, the assembly line, right? And so the Ford Motor Company, uh, led by Henry Ford, um, invents the Model T. Um, and it's not just the Model T that's, uh, you know, the real invention here that makes it possible for a common man. It's the idea of how they did it. And they used something called the assembly line. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in later in the lecture. We talk about, um, you know, innovations in uh, production and so forth. Um, but essentially, the Model T made cars affordable for the common person. And um, when the, you know, people were able to buy cars, um, it changes uh, you know, lifestyles a lot um, and a lot of social behaviors. And because you're teenagers, and I like to tell the story, you know, um, the automobile changes things as simple as, as dating practices, right? Courting, courtships. Um, you know, before the automobile, like if you were a young man who wanted to court a young lady in a, in a fancy word at that time saying, you know, you wanted to date them, you had to go to their parents' home and the, the date would proceed pretty much in the foyer or living room of the, the family home with the, the parents uh, or older siblings being a chaperone to that date. Um, and so now when you have the automobile, it kind of changes that where the young man can just drive up, um, the young woman jumps in, they go off to, you know, the park or whatever they go do and such, and it changes social behaviors. And I always like to tell that story because, you know, kids always get a, you know, a kick out of that. How, how much something as simple as the invention of the automobile changes social behaviors like that. Um, and if you really think about it more, think about how life would be different without the automobile, how much different it would be without it. Um, it gives people more mobility. It shrinks the size of our country. Um, you know, of course, the automobiles are going to be more popular in the cities to start with. But over time, more roads will be built and things uh, will become, 
you know, the automobile becomes a necessity in, in America. Other innovations is the airplane. Um, and while the airplane doesn't play a humongous role in early on in this time period that we're talking about, it is worth noting because it was invented during this time period. And in 1903, the Wright brothers, um, who were um, basically bicycle shop owners, uh, invented uh, the uh, airplane, uh, first viably uh, you know, flown airplane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Now, if you're ever in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, or near there, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, I highly suggest you go check this out. It is a national monument today, and it is really, really cool. And I got to go there as a kid, so I highly suggest it. Um, very, very fascinating stuff. Now, um, the airplane, when it's invented, it's not very safe, uh, nor is it very... Uh, useful as far as a, uh, a transportation device or a transportation um, uh, resource at this time. Um, but over time it does change. Um, and of course it does lead to you know, faster transportation and more mobility of people. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things you could say about the airplane um, today, but not necessarily during the time period we're talking about in this lecture. So let's move on to scientific innovations and discoveries. Um, there's quite a lot you can really talk about. And I just kind of cherry picked uh, uh, some important ones that are worth noting. Um, Heinrich Hertz, uh, he is the one who is the first to produce radio waves that has implications uh, later on as far as um, you know, the invention of the radio and so forth. Um, in 1892, the viruses are discovered by Dmitry Ivanovsky. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, once we discover what viruses are and so forth, that's a huge, uh, um, something, a huge thing to learn in, in, in medicine and how viruses work and so forth. Um, Wilhelm Rodgen, um, he's Rodgen, he's going to invent the x-rays or discover x-rays, I should say. J.J. Thompson discovers electrons. Uh, 1899, aspirin's invented. Uh, 1905, Einstein's theory of general relativity is, uh, you know, comes around. Um, so these are, you know, things that are significant, especially when you talk about the scientific field. Um, but one that I do want to highlight in 1907, Fritz Haber um, invents this process uh, for being able to make commercially uh, amounts of ammonium. Now, um, that may not seem like a huge deal, but when we're talking about what ammonium is used for, it's used, used a lot primarily in fertilizer. Um, and fertilizer production, as a result, ends up increasing. And that's really important to note because when we start to use commercialized uh, fertilizers, it allows us to increase our food production, thus increase population, and so forth. So it is, you know, one of those inventions that does not get a whole lot of recognition, but extremely important in the view of this teacher. Um, but everything in history is relative to our own viewpoints, and uh, ultimately. So agricultural innovations kind of continuing on. Um, yes, there are some a lot of innovations uh, in agriculture at this time. The uh, use of commercial. Um, Fertilizer increases during this time. Um, you also see the invention of barbed wire. Barbed wire is a really important invention, um, especially when we're talking about you know going back east. Now, barbed wire um, was invented as a cheap way to be able to fence in um, range lands uh, so that people's livestock, their cattle, um, their, um, their horses wouldn't wander off, but it also um, would stop the cowboys uh, from being able to drive cattle from Texas to um, you know, places like Nebraska. Um, you know, and oftentimes these, these cattle drives would go right through people's farmlands and destroy their crops. And so this invention, which was cheap and it was easily available, um, allowed them to fence the West and thus ending the cattle drives and destroying the livelihoods of cowboys. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's an invention that you will see all over the place in the West still today. If you go on any road trip uh, into rural parts of the country, you will see those fences that line along the fence or line along the, the highways and interstates often are using barbed wire because it's cheap and, and readily available and helps fence in farmlands and grazing lands as well. 
the horse-drawn combine was invented, which is up here, this invention right here. Um, and this allowed the production of things like wheat to take off. Um, and wheat, of course, used in grains for flour and bread, and that's an important product as far as feeding a population. You know, prior to this, um, you know, invention, you still had people who were using um, uh, hand-held threshers, and, and they would thresh the wheat uh, by hand. And, and so one person could only do so much by hand. But once this comes around, you're going to have a much higher amount of production of things like wheat. Um, and at the same time, this kind of opens the possibility for agrotechnology. What else can be invented that makes it easier for the farmers to be able to harvest their, their products, right? In 1892, the first uh, gasoline tractor is going to come around. And of course, the horse-drawn um, combines will eventually be replaced by tractor combines. Um, but, you know, the same thing kind of happens. Now you have something much more uh, reliable in a gasoline tractor than having all of these horses have to feed and take care and manage and so forth. Um, there is an increased amount of commercial farming during this time as well. And so the small family farms that had, you know, build up in the West, you know, they start to disappear and, and commercial businesses start to buy them out and just start, start to take on large scale production much more during this time period. And so that's something that a trend that does continue and still continues today. Um, but that's something that is important to note that's starting to happen during this time period. Another like practice in agriculture that you'll start to see more commonly is bonsai farming, where farmers would be focusing on one, maybe two different types of products. And this is something that's not that different from today. Uh, if you go to places like Nebraska and Iowa, um, I guarantee you that there are going to be three crops that you're going to find within a stone's throw of where you're standing. It's either going to be corn, it's going to be wheat, it's going to be soybeans. And those are the big products that uh, are grown by farmers primarily in the Western states still today. And so that's uh, something that comes around. This idea of bonsai farming is going to uh, come around during this time period. A lot of manufacturing innovations as well. Um, well, I'll come back there. Um, the Bessemer process. This is uh, an important and can be not be understated in process that was invented in the United Kingdom, um, but it was essentially, I wouldn't say stolen, but borrowed by some people, particularly a guy named Andrew Carnegie, uh, who learned how this process worked and brought it to the United States. Um, but basically, you have these giant furnaces in which you, you know, put pig iron in, uh, as well as a couple other materials. And then you blast it with like, you know, you, you turn up the heat and you blast it with, uh, you know, air. And so it turns it super hot, melting and so forth, um, this pig iron. And then from that, you get a separation of the impurities and the particles that weaken iron uh, and make it not as strong. And you get rid of those. And what you end up having is steel with uh, something those impurities are out. So it doesn't oxidize. Uh, it doesn't weaken and steel. Um, is able to be produced in large, large numbers. And so Andrew Carnegie takes this um, you know, concept. He builds a giant steel production uh, in an American city. I bet you can guess who, which city it is if I told you that their football team is named after the product that they're going to make or the people who made that product, right? So in Pittsburgh, you know, he has these giant uh, steel production uh, it's not the only place, but that's why Pittsburgh is the steel town. So the um, Bessemer process, a, this manufacturing innovation helps to make it possible. And steel is used in everything. It's used in building skyscrapers in New York City and other cities. It's been you know, used uh, to build the new Navy of the United States. It, you know, steel ships uh, are stronger, they, they can resist artillery hits much easier, they don't rust, you know, that is really, really important. So I cannot understate the importance of this manufacturing innovation in helping build our country. So coming back to the assembly line, which I talked about the Model T, the Model T um, was, you know, invented, uh, you know, 
by Henry Ford through the, the assembly line. The idea of the assembly line is not a radically new one, but it is a one that was tweaked from a previous idea that you can go back to um, called um, the Cincinnati system. And if you're a vegetarian, I would skip ahead for about 30 seconds. But the Cincinnati system was invented in Cincinnati at the uh, slaughterhouses where they would slaughter pigs. And so they made it so they would have uh, basically a line um, where every person in that line had a job. So one person's job was to hang up the pig um, on these rafters that would go across the room and such as just slide across the room down this line. And then they, you know, one person's job was to cut the throat of the pig. One person's was to slice into it. One person's was to pull out the organs. One person's was to make this cut and that cut and so forth until at the end you ended having a product that was, you know, taken and butchered in a very fast and efficient way and then, you know, sold to the public, right? So taking that concept um, and, and other things that were learned in, in other manufacturing uh, through scientific dis, you know, understanding of how to increase production, Henry Ford basically takes the idea of a car, breaks it down to very simple jobs. Your job on the assembly line could be something as simple as you put on the right passenger wheel. You don't tighten the wheel, you just put it on. And then it goes down to the next person, then you'll have people who tighten those wheels, right? And then you have a person who puts on the steering wheel, you have the person who puts on the um, the, the, um, the shifter and so forth. And, I, you know, I'm not going to get too much into the technicalities of, of cars and such, but you get the idea. So that makes it possible to where you have a, a new car uh, rolling off the line about every four minutes. Uh, and now you've been able to do something basically that allows mass production. And when we're talking about production, you know, you have a product, there's more availability of a product, the demand's going to be there, it, you know, and if it doesn't increase dramatically, you know, because of that prices of the cars go down and make it possible for the common man to own cars. Now, Working on an assembly line had to be excruciatingly boring because you had one job you did all the time you know, for 12 hours a day, five days a week, and so on and so forth. That would be bad. So how do you keep people in those jobs? You pay them well. And because they were paid well, they could take that money and then they could buy a Ford themselves. It was a really brilliant innovation in manufacturing that was put forth by Henry Ford and something that would end up becoming um, the basis for uh, American manufacturing going forward. Even today, we use a, a variation of the assembly line in, in factories today. So moving on to communication innovations, okay? Uh, and there are some others. I'm going to hit the big ones here. But in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. And the telephone eventually replaces the telegraph. The telegraph, which was you know, a way for people to communicate over long distances using a series of dashes and beeps um, that would um, translate to an alphabet and people would sit on the other side line listening to these sounds translate it into uh, a message. And the messages usually typically, if you're talking about Western Union, were about 160 characters long, very similar to what Twitter was when it first came out. And so the um, dashes and dots and such, you know, allow communication over a long period or long distance, but it's limit. Once the telephone is invented, it definitely opens up the possibilities for more clear and complex communication over long distances. So Alexander Graham Bell, um, his patent on the, uh, the telephone and the invention of the telephone um, certainly changes the lives of people today. I know, especially as teenagers living in 2020, you can't imagine a world where the telephone isn't available. And think about how your lives could be different if the telephone wasn't available, right? Um, and so the impact both socially, economically, um, politically, there's so many things that it changes the way we live um, that simple innovation. In 1890, the first radio is invented, um, although it doesn't really become more commercially sold into the 1910s. Um, but the radio itself is going to be an important communication device and it eventually becomes the new form of mass media 
that allows for um, people to broadcast information, entertainment, uh, news, so forth. Um, and so that's something worth noting as well, an important innovation of this time period and that it changes the way we live. Marketing innovations, um, you know, there's a lot of new advertisements. I'm gonna put myself over here because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what it says there. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, one thing that other history teachers probably won't talk about that I will as far as an important in marketing innovation would be the Sears Mailer catalog. So Sears is a store, which I'm pretty sure they're out of business now. They gone bankrupt, they filed for bankruptcy several times in my lifetime. Um, but Sears was a company that pretty much was your general store that had everything you needed, right? Think of Amazon of the 1890s. Um, and Amazon, very similar but different in the way they do it. Um, essentially, the Sears mailer catalog was mailed out to people. Anyone had an address, they, they sent one too. And in those catalogs, you could buy everything from clothes to machine parts. You can even buy guns through the Sears ma mailer catalog, right? And, you know, people, all they had to do was get on a phone or a telegraph. And then basically I want to get this number of products. So each product had a um, product number or something like that. And then you'd send your um, money through the mail. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, transported by railroad or wherever, um, you got what you had ordered. So that's kind of really neat um, when we talk about marketing innovations and the ability to, to get products to people from afar. And that was pretty neat um, when you consider that most people had to go to general stores that were close and you really were limited of what that general store had. Now the catalog gives you more availability of products, right? Advertisements also increased during this time, and we'll talk more about the advertisements increasing in the 1920s more so, but um, you see, you know, more advertisements found in printed materials such as newspapers, magazines, right? Um, of course, you have some examples. I found funny examples, so you guys get a kick out of this. But yes, cocaine toothache drops, right? Now, this is not something that's available anymore for obvious reasons, but you know, there were a lot of medicines that were um, advertised and sold um, as kind of the cure-alls for, for anything that ails you. Um, it didn't necessarily work out that way. Um, but yes, um, if you had a toothache, um, you could buy these things that basically had cocaine in them and that would help you get rid of the toothache, which I imagine did work to an extent. Uh, I could also imagine that it was not very good for your long-term health. Neither was the electricity a natural cure treatment um, and where you would give yourself uh, a generous shock through this belt um, to cure issues uh, that you might have health wise as well. Um, yes, uh, medicine has changed and become much more advanced in our lifetime than it has during this time period. So. To finish off, there are a lot of inventions that I did not go over. And, and, and when you guys do your project, your assignment, which will ask you to find and uh, create a top 10 list of inventions during this time and base it off of which ones had the biggest influence in shaping the world and the, the, that you live in today. Um, but some other ones that are definitely notable, you know, it, you can't not talk about Thomas Edison. He's not the only inventor this time. Um, there's Nikolai Tesla, um, who I really like, but you know, I don't want to go on and on about it. So if you guys want to learn more about him, I'm going to allow you to do that on your own. But Thomas Edison um, created almost a thousand inventions, a lot of thousand of patent inventions, including things like the phonograph, which would allow music to be recorded and then brought to your home. So you, if you wanted to listen to the London Symphony Orchestra, um, you know, play Mozart, um, you could get a recording of that and bring it to your home and play it on the phonograph itself. Now, was the quality as good as it is today? Absolutely not. But at that time, you know, when you're comparing it to nothing, it, it sounds wonderful when you have those sounds. You don't have to go to um, the theater. You don't have to go to a, uh, a uh, 
club or something like that to, to, to listen to music, you can do it in the comfort of your own home. The electric generator, um, you know, he's not the only one that developed an electric generator, but his, he is one who did develop an electric generator. Um, and and, and um, it's an important note because it helps fuel uh, the second industrial revolution even more so in, and think about how the world will be different today without electricity. Uh, the light bulb um, is one that he definitely gets the most credit for. Um, and think about the, how the light bulb changes the world. I mean, it basically vanishes the dark. Uh, it changes our biological sense of when we go to sleep. You know, our bodies typically, when the light disappears, we find ways to sleep. Now, um, some of us are up into the late hours of the night. Some of you who may be watching this right now at 2 a.m. doing distance learning, um, you do it because of Thomas Edison. Um, and the invention of not just, you know, electrical generation and so forth, but also the incandescent light bulb. Um, batteries, also an important invention uh, that uh, he gets credited with. Motion pictures, um, another invention. And the original motion pictures um, were just little things that they were called Nickelodeons, in which you could like find them on the street. Um, you stick a nickel in them and then it would hit play and you get like 15, 20 seconds of, um, you know, a person riding a bicycle or a cat jumping up in the air or something like that. You know, not very impressive by today's standards, but think about before then, like, you did you ever have something where you can see a picture actually move? And so the idea of the motion picture um, comes from Thomas Edison. In 1889, he also invents or creates the General Electric Company, which is, you know, one of America's biggest industrial industries um, and companies in, in the world. Um, so that's something that's important to know as well. Um, other notable inventions, refrigerators, you know, the fact that we could preserve things like meat much longer. Um, you had, uh, because of the refrigerator, you would have these huge slaughterhouses in Chicago um, that would slaughter uh, cattle from the West, um, and then put them on refrigerated carts and transport them to the East to be sold at market. Um, that's m huge. And so it changes the American diet more so as a result, um, which you could argue is not always for the better. Typewriters, um, where you can now write things down much faster uh, and, and crisper, um, you know, from type, you know, handwriting to typing. Um, that's an important invention to note. The sewing machine, which allowed for, um, you know, textile production and, and making of clothes much easier, um, where people can then have more variety of clothes in their wardrobe. Um, typically, people had two different types of dresses or types of outfits. One was your Sunday best and one was for working. Um, now they could have multiple um, wardrobe items, okay? Skyscrapers uh, allow cities to grow. Um, when they run out of horizontal space, they can now grow vertically into the air. And so cities like New York City, Chicago, um, Baltimore, Boston, uh, all are cities that uh, will have skyscrapers um, and they get bigger and bigger as the time as time goes on. Uh, and of course, the washing machine is another one too. A personal favorite of mine because I can't imagine having to wash my hand, my clothes by hand. I've done it before. I'm not that old, but I've done it before. Uh, and the washing machine is a nice home device that uh, allows uh, time to be saved uh, and, and, and money too. So, okay. Well, that is it in terms of our first lecture for standard 1.1. You will have an assignment that is uh, an assessment that is associated with this. I will ask you to create a top 10 list using some of the interventions that uh, I talked about in lecture today. But if you find others, um, you may use those as well. But I want you to rank the top 10 inventions of this time period using your argumentative skills and telling me why is one invention more important than the other? Think about the impacts of that invention. How has it changed life as we know it today? If we didn't have this, we wouldn't have all these things either. So think in that terms, okay? So um, your essential question though for this one, pick three of these areas and identify and explain how innovations in those areas impacted America in 
in different ways, right? Socially, politically, economically, whatever, okay? Um, so make sure you take time to respond. And that is it from here. If you have any questions, uh, you can always reach out to me. Um, but that concludes this lecture and I will see you all next time. And there's an awkward stage where I have to get this to work and stop.